Hello, beautiful people. It's Quinton from the Hunters of Light, and uh, this creative showcase is a special one for me. It's by far the one that has me the most starstruck because we've got a photographer on who I've followed for a while, um, and I was really excited when he said he would chat to me about his work. Um, and it's also one year and two days after the Hunters of Light was launched on uh, South Africa's uh, lockdown. That uh, first infamous 21 days where everyone thought 21 days and we're back to uh, to normal. Uh, so in 365 days, we've grown to just over 3,300 members on Facebook. Um, we've generated 94 videos on our Hunters of Light uh, YouTube channel. And I want to say a huge thank you to all those who have participated to date and will continue to help grow this uh, initiative. I really, really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. And the people that, um, that have benefited from, you know, hints and tips or, or just, you know, being motivated and inspired through this period, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we could help in, in some small way. All right, so on to our guest today. Tony Rosland um, is a third generation photographer specializing in architecture and headshot photography. Uh, and after 25 years in the industry, he's focused uh, most recently on education with tutorials and architecture in architecture and product photography and available on ProEDU. Uh, he's also the co-host of uh, Unparalleled, a podcast for photographers and creatives. Tony lives in the Pacific Northwest uh, of the United States with his wife and two kids. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> as I said, I'm, I'm a little starstruck. Uh, just expect me to um and ah and uh, 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 because yeah, Tony Rosalind, uh, works amazing, can't wait to chat. So cue the intro. See what I did there? Cue the intro. All right, here we go. Back on with uh, with Tony. Um, as he was uh, just saying, now nah, he's uh, you know work comes first. He was at a meeting, um, you know, just uh, getting back and forth, and, I, and and it's one of those amazing things that the Hunters for Light was started um, because of lockdown. Uh, everyone lost their work overnight, um, and uh, you know this was really here just to uh, try and motivate, educate, and inspire photographers when they were all sitting around, uh, you know, freaking out about what was going to happen, etc. So I'm glad that uh, things are picking up, certainly on our side and, and obviously on your side. So, yeah, thank goodness. And, and, and here we go. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, I'm 29th year of taking photos for money. And uh, I've been through a few ups and downs in the past. And, you know, people start to panic usually yeah. uh, pretty early on when if you just stay the course, Make sure you've saved for that rainy day. You can usually weather through it, and things will bounce back around, you know. But uh, you just have to have to have uh, planned well enough that you can survive through those dry times, you know. Absolutely, and I think the you know one of the problems that um, that we have on this side uh, of uh, of the sea is that you know when we're buying products from from the states and Europe, we've got to you know make a, a mega multiplication in order to to get that so you know uh, there's there's a lot of money that needs to be saved up for but but one of the things that we don't do is actually put away um you know money for those sort of eventualities and i, I think that what um what we've recommended in the past is every single shoot take a percentage whether it's five percent ten percent whatever put it in an account that you never yeah. touch so that um yeah. you don't even know that it's there but it's automatically going in and then if something does happen you know at least you've got a little bit of backup yeah, that's good advice for sure. Um, and, and not, you know, don't go into debt over this. That's the big thing. Um, if you have a bunch of debt for gear equipment leases and, and huge studio overheads and things like that, it, it makes it even harder on you when, when things do get lean. And uh, it makes it hard to be creative when all you can think about is what am I going to do to pay the rent next month? Or how am I going to pay that phase one lease or whatever it is that Absolutely. You know, you're, you're in debt with? So Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, so maybe uh, let's let's just start with where you started. Where was was the plan always to be a photographer, or did you start uh, somewhere a little bit more left field than that? No, um, so I'm third generation. Anybody who's followed me for more yeah. than a day probably already knows that. Uh, so I literally grew up in the studios, and my father and grandfather were portrait and wedding photographers. And so, you know, like a lot of kids. Uh, I had no desire to do what my parents were doing. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to be a photographer like my dad. And so, um, 
you know, I did photography in high school. Uh, I was a yearbook photographer and that kind of stuff. And and I was doing uh, my after school job was uh, passport photos. I started with passport photos right. and headshots and things like that. Uh, but then I joined the service. I was like, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to be a police officer or something, you know. So I joined the joined the military, went through like SEAL training and all that good stuff and got my ass kicked through the military. <laughs> and then when I got out, uh, you know, six years later, I was like, hey, um, what am I going to do now? And I started revisiting photography. Um, my dad was still working at the time right. and uh, he's retired now, but, uh, you know, I started looking at photography again, but not in the portrait and wedding side. I, I was old enough then to realize there's more genres in photography mm-hmm. than just what my dad and grandfather did. Right. So, um, I, I really liked product. And so I kind of attacked product and, uh, started learning how to shoot product. Um, you know, unfortunately, my father and grandfather were not product photographers, so there wasn't a whole lot of insight that I could get right. from them there, other, other than basic photography uh, education, you know, what inverse square was and, yeah. you know, what happens with lighting modifiers and things like that, you know. Um, so I just kind of self-taught myself how to do product photography. Um, I was living in Southern California at the time. And then uh, when I got married and my wife and I moved up here to Washington State, um, the area that we moved to, there's not a lot of ad agencies and things around. So we're not getting a lot of hero product work here. Right. Um, and so I, I had to pivot to stay alive, you know. Um, and so I looked around and said, where is there something missing up here? And it was in architecture photography. And so uh, I thought, well, shit, you know, architecture is just a giant product, really. So yeah. if I approach it and with a similar you know, uh, style, uh, maybe it'll work out. And it fortunately it has, I've been doing it now, you know, about a dozen years up yeah. here. Um, and that's our bread and butter is architecture photography. So that's, that's kind of my, you know, that's, that's how I got to where I am today. So, yeah, I mean, uh, from, from the looks of your, um, architecture photography, the, 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 the post-production of it, it's, it's, uh, I love it. It's, it's, it's very clean. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of work that, uh, that goes into it. Uh, and I know you were saying that, and and, and it, uh, that's probably a lot of that's got to do with where the uh, the product, uh, you know, the finished art for the the product photography came from. Um, but I, I know that you were, sure. um, you know, were mentioning before that uh, you don't really do much of the retouching yourself anymore because you're so busy um, and you've outsourced that. You, that's obviously the, the the way to go when um, when you get to a point where you've got to decide right. So. Uh, I'm either shooting or I'm, uh, you know, editing, um, which is more profitable. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. That's exactly the formula is where can I make more money? Uh, Is it sitting behind a computer editing the photos or is it out shooting the next project? Um, Or, you know, you also have to weigh in the life work balance, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I have two kids and if I'm shooting all day and editing all night, when do I play with my kids? You know? So, uh, I just decided that it's worth my sanity and my time, um, and more profitable for me to farm out the retouching part. And, um, (laughs) which admittedly is not easy to do. Uh, you know, as artists, we inherently Mm want to maintain this control over our work. Right. Um, and so finding someone that can edit, the way that you had envisioned things going in your head uh, that you can trust to do that, uh, that, that takes a little bit of a gut check to, to finally let go of that control, you know, but once you do it and you realize, Hey, this is actually working. Um, after that, you'll never want to edit your own stuff again. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I understand that uh, completely. You know, the last thing I want to do is, uh, cause I mean, you, 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 you shot it in a certain way. You, 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 you know, you, you knew that you were maybe clipping a highlight there, but, but you knew what you were doing, because you're going to do this, that, and the other later. Um, right. And now you, you give this to someone, and, and unless you brief them on every single image, the, the, you know, there's, no, there's no sort of handover, and, and they're there going, okay, well, I know the style, and I know what, uh, what Tony wants, so right. let's do it. Right. You know? So I suppose, yeah, that, yep. that level of trust is immense. Yeah, and if you work with someone, as you say, for a while, they get used to your style. They start to know what you want. Um, of course, I include some general notes, yeah. uh, and I say, like, if there's a particular person I want to use in the final in the final image, like a you know composite. A lot of my stuff is composite, yeah. uh, and so there may be a dude on a bike riding through the scene somewhere, and I want I want that 
in the final shot. So I'll, I'll tell the editor, you know, Hey, uh, shot number 279, we use the dude on the bike, you know, yeah. and they can make sure that they put that in there. But, um, w- one thing that I found that really helps is I try to hire retouchers who are also photographers. Right. Yeah, um, absolutely. Cause then they understand, um, the whole process and have a pretty good understanding of why I might have captured mm. certain frames. And so when it comes to putting this stuff together, they already have the eye. Uh, and so it makes it uh, a much better finished product. I found, um, I used Barry McKenzie for uh, a number of years. He's a phenomenal uh, shooter and retoucher. Um, and then, uh, he's, he, he hates it. Uh, but you know, he's really good at it. So, yeah. um, He's gotten busy, and so I've been sending. Uh, I tried mono visual uh, retouching for a while, and Marat over there is really good. Um, but most recently, I've really fallen um, into a rhythm with uh, Navid, and um, I'm trying to remember the, the uh, his full handle on Instagram. I'll, I'll give you this information later if you want Fantastic. to post this yeah. stuff. For, yeah, for I'll viewers, pop it into but, the into um, the comments. A great, great architecture shooter, um, probably better than I am, but he's uh, he's also an excellent editor and he can just make my images sing the way that it was in my head, uh, even if I didn't shoot it as well as I should have. So it's a little bit of magic sprinkled on the end there. Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, the, 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 as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the finish of, uh, of the images are fantastic. You know, I mean, I, um, one of the things that I've, uh, that I've done is I've... Um, uh, watched your um, architecture uh, tutorial uh, as well as your, your yeah. product photography tutorial um, clearly I've got a long way to go <laughs> I'm definitely not anywhere close to your level but it, the whole thing with those sorts of things is to to try and um, you know improve your skills and and, and find uh, the next step you know to try and improve uh, yourself and just uh, expand your horizons um, and I think if if uh, if you're watching this and you haven't seen um, uh, any of Tony's uh, tutorials, uh, are they, they're all on ProEdu.com, hey? Huh? Or have you got another uh, channel that they're on? That's that's where you find them, ProEdu.com. Cool. And I would say, you know, I wouldn't say that you're not shooting at the same level. I would say that the tutorials, um, <clears throat> the reason we put so much information in them is is for two reasons one for those people who are inexperienced they can watch it from start to finish right. and, and probably get a pretty good overall education on the process right but also if you're already an experienced shooter the idea on watching a tutorial like that is to try to pick up just a nugget of information mm. and that makes it worth the whole thing right so even if you are an experienced shooter and you are working on the same level i pick up stuff from other photographers all the time and I'm like, oh, I never even thought to do that, you know? Yeah. And so we tried to cover a lot of different stuff like that in tutorials so that even experienced photographers can walk away with something that they can put in their toolbox, you know? Absolutely. So, and I, I, from, from my point of view, there's, there was just so much there. I, I, it was a fantastic uh, tutorial. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, so well, I, have, yeah. I have one other question. Um, I'm, I'm mates with um, Roger Machen, who is uh, the pro product manager for Canon in South Africa. And I, I said to him one day, I've seen Tony shoots with a 17 mil tilt shift, but then he puts a 1.4 extender on it, um, you know, which kind of gives you a 24. And he said, what? What is he doing? Isn't he losing quality, et cetera? So I, I, I need to hear from you so that I can pass it on to him. Uh, you know, what, what was the thinking there? Yeah, so it's actually uh, not 100% accurate. I shoot with a 24 and okay. I put the 1.4, ah, which gives okay. me about a 35 um, because they don't make a 35 tilt shift. And sometimes I just want a little bit more of a compressed scene, but not quite as much as the 50 TS gives me. Right. So I take the 24, I put the 1.4 on, it gives me a 35. Okay. I never really put the extender on the 17 because that just takes me up to a 24. Which you've so, got anyway. Um, <clears throat> which I've got anyway. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So you, I know it's hard to tell on social media sometimes what kind of, uh, you know, stuff is being stacked up there, but I'm almost positive. I didn't do it in a tutorial cause it would be really weird for me to put an extender on the 17. It wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. So yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw it on your social media. I was like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, all right. No, well, that's cool. So, um, as, as if, uh, if Tim's got some images for you, uh, ready to go, then let's, uh, let's check it out. Um, let me know when you are ready and I'll uh, share the screen. Okay, cool. So this is, um, uh, a new brewery in town. So Spokane is full of old, uh, buildings that are from, this used to be a big train stop, uh, for West people heading West, uh, back in whatever late 1800s or something. So, um, 
they have a lot of old buildings that were sprouted up back then to support the travelers and the people that lived here and that sort of stuff. Um, and a lot of those cool old buildings are being rehabbed by architects and designers these days into cool shit like this brewing company. You know, yeah. um, this is one of my favorite stomping grounds. <clears throat> In fact, Tim and I were there yesterday uh, drinking <laughs> beers after work. <clears throat> They've got these beautiful bay doors that open up. They go out to this beer garden and stuff. And it's just, it's a really cool vibe. So um, this was for an architect, uh, Trek Architecture. And um, they're a small firm here, just a few guys, but they're doing some really cool stuff. Um, <clears throat> this is the final image. This is what it looks like. Um, and we did have uh, Mono Visual uh, retouched this for us. And then we put our own spin. Um, usually I expect my retouchers to get it to about 90%. Right. And then I can throw my own 10% at the end. Um so I don't know. Do you want me just to kind of go through some of these layers that I have? And show yeah, you absolutely. Kind of what yeah. They gave us and where I went. Absolutely. Cool. So let's see. I don't. There's not a ton here because he he sends me back that flat and tiff. But this is kind of what he sent me back. So he gets me ninety percent of the way there. The street was full of potholes and things. And yeah. then when he sent me the image, um, he had made it like perfect pavement. And I was like, eh, that's a little <laughs> over the top. You know, yeah. so I had him dial it back and leave some of the lines in the pavement there, you know, the discoloration and stuff, because we wanted it to look fairly natural. But uh, the overall ambiance of the photo is pretty much how we captured it. Um, you know, the sky looked like that and the lighting on the building looked like that. There was a couple of lights out on the sign. Um, yeah. And so he had to create that light in post to make it look like those light bulbs were still there. Um, but the rest of this is all just caught with uh, natural light. Now, Tim, did we use the strobe inside? We didn't have a strobe inside this? Okay. So this is just waiting for that light to balance your interior and exterior yeah. balance out so that you have uh, your ex interior exposure is actually registering <laughs> to the sensor without making the outside too dark. Yes. So this was that perfect time of day. Um, the only compositing done here, as I say, the street was one thing, uh, fixing some of the burnt out light bulbs. And then this dude in the pink here on the bike um, he rolled up and I grabbed a frame for that. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, we got to, we got to use that. It just pops your eye over there. It helps keep your eye moving through the scene um, and, and allows you to um, continue moving around uh, instead of just getting stuck right on the corner there. So uh, from there I added birds. Okay. Yeah. Got to put a bird on it. Yeah, right. Yeah. That just helps fill that space. It, make, it kind of felt organic. We blur the birds a little bit um, so that they look like they have motion. Let me see if I can zoom in. You can see it. So you can yeah, see they're yeah. not tack sharp. So yeah. we blur them just a little bit, you know, cause we're going to be dragging the shutter for a shot like this. So we wanted to make it uh, so that it looked realistic. And that's just with a brush. We use a bird brush. You can right. download them <laughs> okay. online. Bam. There's yep. a bird brush. I was just going to say, are they, are they stock birds? Uh, but yeah, if they're, if they're a brush, I mean, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. And I have a whole library full of them and you'll see that uh, like, Anything that I've shot in the past year, you'll probably see birds on it. And I'm going to do it from now on because I think it just helps add something else in the sky to keep your eye moving through the scene, right? Absolutely. Um, then we changed the color of the sky a little bit. We wanted to give it a little bit more warmth that helped with the bricks uh, and kind of tied in the reds in the building and then the pink of the guy in the jacket and stuff. So you can see here, it's very blue and cool. And then we have it going a little bit warmer. Right. Um, and we do that with, um, uh, you know, just a hue satch layer here. Um, but a lot of times we'll even do uh, Photoshop's new sky replacement. Some yes. of the other images I have may or may not have that, but that Photoshop sky replacement is phenomenal. The algorithm that they use for making selections and <clears throat> the way that it can cast color onto the subject uh, below the sky and things like that to give it that natural look is absolutely amazing. So if you haven't checked that out, definitely get in and play with that sky replacement tool. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things with, um, you know, uh, trying to do the sky replacements is that you, you know, you, you may have tones that are in the building that are very different to what the sky would be producing. So it doesn't have that natural feel. Right. Yeah. And and if you've ever tried to make selections around mm. like tree leaves and stuff like that, you're going <laughs> to yeah. want to you're going to want to slit your wrists, you know? And so having this thing that can just do it really well, uh, I was blown away, uh, when I started testing that out. Um, I tried some other apps like, um, uh, what's another one that I use? Um, 
Luminar. Yeah, yeah Luminar. Yeah. I tried Luminar. I'm talking to my assistant, Sam, off screen here. So he, he helps me. He's my memory. So uh, Luminar, they have a good AI for sky replacement. Um, it gives you a lot of control over uh, a lot of different aspects of that. But I found the algorithm for selecting like around leaves and things like that in Photoshop is far superior. So I'm a okay. big fan of that one. That's very interesting. Um, what's this? Oh, uh, that's just an extra layer that I combined everything into. Yeah. Um, and then I copied that layer and I added some sharpening. Um, so I do, uh, if you've seen the tutorial, you've probably seen this sharpening. It's a two step thing. I only did one of them here. I don't always do both steps, but I use the unsharp mask, um, 100 over one. Right. Uh, let me show you filter sharpen unsharp mask. So I'll do amount 100 yep. over radius of one. And that just gives it a little bit more crisp. It yep. makes everything just sharpening, like literal sharpening, edge sharpening, right? And then after that, a lot of times what I'll do is command J. I'll go into another layer and I'll do sharpen, unsharp mask, 15 over 45. And that's opposite. So instead of this real fine detailed edge sharpening, this is a little bit broader contrast on the edges and let's see if you can see a difference here i don't know if you'll be able to see it on the screen but maybe you can let me see so if you look around like the the brick detail and stuff yeah. in here when i turn this layer on you kind of see how it gets mm. contrasty i don't know if that's showing through on ecamm or not but it just adds a lot of contrast to an image so if you have a contrast uh, an image that's lacking a little bit in that contrast you can use that sharpening process to add it in just to the edges without uh like a curves adjustment would be an overall right. um, contrast adjustment whereas this only does it to the edge details it's just kind of cool so yeah, that's very cool those are usually my my finishing moves is the unsharp mask 100 over one and 15 over 45 and i may not use them both uh i'll toggle them on and off and find yeah. out what i like and what i don't like um in this case i only used uh the 100 over one um but I built them into actions so I can just click a button and boom, it, yeah. it puts it on there. And I don't have to go through what I just showed you every time. So um, anyway, that's uh, that's how that image ended up. And it was just, uh, you know, right waiting for the right light, really. A um, little bit of adjustment for sky color, throw some birds in there and, you know, it's a finished image. Yeah, oh, fantastic. I mean, the, 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 I'm, I'm, uh, I suppose, surprised that, um, you know, the, the, the aren't uh, more images that, that have gone into, uh, you know, the facades and, and that sort of thing, because it, it kind of feels a little bit like there's, there's been additional light that's been, uh, you know, uh, strobes that have been uh, used there. But uh, wow, uh, fantastic. I mean, you must have amazing light there. <laughs> or what, what do people normally say? You must have an amazing camera. <laughs> Yeah, it is. In fact, this was the um, uh, Sony a7R4, for those right. people wondering what camera this was shot with. And the resolution on that thing is amazing. Um, I don't shoot with Sony anymore. I had a short stint over with Sony. Well, I've actually shot Sony a couple times in my career, but most recently um, I had the EOS R, which yes. was their first mirrorless camera. Love the camera. It was a little lacking in dynamic range for me. Um, and so I jumped over to Sony for a while, uh, the a7R4, which has huge dynamic range and huge resolution until the R5 came out. And then I dumped all the Sony stuff, went back yeah. to Canon and I'm, I'm at home with Canon. I love Canon stuff, uh, the color. And and you you mentioned clean images and mm -hmm. things like that before uh, with my style. And one of the the things that I like about Canon is their auto white balance, white priority. Yeah, yeah. It is far superior to any other camera brand. And believe me, I've used Phase One, I've used Nikon, I've used Sony, I've used Fuji, I've used Canon. I mean, all of them. And it, the Canon auto white balance, white priority is far superior. It just nails it uh and that gets you a really good starting point for stuff if you want that clean imagery um now some people like to keep a little bit more natural color cast from the sun and things in their images and that's fine too um i think they have an auto white balance ambient priority which which would give you that ability um but for my style and the way that i shoot i like whites to be crisp and clean and it's just kind of my style and if i changed it it would probably look weird yeah, I mean, I think that so, um, you know that kind of feels um, quite nice and commercial, which which I enjoy. So, uh, you know, that's uh, that's something that I appreciate. 
<clears throat> yeah, and most of my clients, uh, if, for those people watching or listening that, that don't know, uh, I do most of the commercial architecture photography. That's my biggest clientele, um, and they want that that clean, mm -hmm. airy, commercial look. Yeah. You know? um, whereas with residential, you can get away with warmer tones streaking exactly. across the couch and living room or something, you know. And that's not necessarily what my clients are after. So. Um, in any case, um, I, I, speaking of gear, I just uh, I'm waiting on my Fuji uh, GFX 100s. So we're actually making a migration to Fuji, I think, um, <laughs> if it's as good as I as I've heard. So, um, but that's back to medium format, um, and uh, Fuji has some great color as well, and 100 megapixel uh, detail is going to be great. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I think that's um, that'd be quite an interesting package to uh, to look at. Yeah, I've got some lenses here already, and, and everything I've heard and friends and colleagues that I talk to that shoot with that Fuji say that the, that Fuji glass is absolutely amazing. Um, they don't have tilt shift lenses, mm -hmm. so I still have to adapt my Canon tilt shifts to the Fuji camera. But uh, they can they can hold up. Those Canon lenses are really sharp, and they'll, they they can still resolve 100 megapixels without any issue. So yeah, no, that that sounds fantastic. I can't wait to hear uh, to see what um, what your images look like with. Uh... Um, with that Fuji? Uh, me either. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, okay, let's see what we got here. Um, let me look at something here. Uh, what else do we have? He's got, oh, this is Innovation Den. Let me bring this up. So, okay. This is one I did for HDG architecture. This is over in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And this is a kind of a co-working space, I guess is the right. easiest way to describe it. Um, I don't know where you're at, if that's a popular thing. Over yeah, there, but yeah, it sprung up West, really, Scott, really nicely in the last couple of years. Huge. Yeah, exactly. Here too. So I don't know who started that, but uh, it's it's gotten very popular here where you just rent a small space or, you know, a shared space or something like that in a building. And that's exactly what we're looking at here. It's kind of a common uh, collaboration pit in the middle. And then mm -hmm. you can see around the top deck of this, there's all these little offices with barn doors. And those are different individual businesses or or whatever, you know, maybe a graphic designer right. in one and a, you know, whatever in the next one. So um, <clears throat> anyway, we shot this and this kind of has that, um, that white crisp whites, you know, as you mentioned mm -hmm. before. And uh, this one was edited uh, by Jason Rayner, um, who's a phenomenal architectural photographer down in Arizona with Rayner Ryan. Um, he was doing a little bit of editing for me when I was buried one time more as a favor than anything. He's, he's not really, doesn't take editing from other people. In fact, he farms a lot of his stuff out these days. Um, but at the time I was buried and I was like, I need help, dude. <laughs> and so he, he volunteered to help me out. So, um, and he's again, an architecture photographer. So he's got that eye Yeah. and he put it together perfectly. I think, um, you know, there's some depth in the photo. That's something that we always try to achieve in the photos is have a foreground element uh, and then a background element. And if we can, a midground, uh, something in midway. <clears throat> if you look back to the Brick West image uh, that we were just talking about a minute ago, there was a tree in the foreground and yeah. then there was the dude on the bike kind of midground. And then you had like the the building with the water tank what it's at the back, yeah. in the background. Right. So this is the same kind of thing. We have the pole and stuff in the foreground and the couch in the foreground. There's some people in the midground. And then we have, you know, the, the rest of the building kind of in the background there. And it just helps pull the eye through the image and give it depth. And that's what the whole uh, purpose is to, to keep these images to have depth so they don't just just they're not just boring and flat. Yeah. Feeling, yeah. You know, um, and so let's go with the people in your um, in your shots. The um, you know I was just going to say now you they're, they're obviously composites, um, you know, and um, and you pop them in as um, as you need them. Yep. So with people, um, we'll set up and we try to get our main space lit and shot first, and then we go through and we put people where we need them, or we wait for people to move through the scene right. in a place that we think is going to end up good in the end, and then uh, we'll put them on their own layers. And um, that way, if a client comes back to us after we deliver an image and they're like, you know, we love the photo, but we don't like that guy on the left hand side over there. We can just go in Photoshop, turn off that layer, re-export the image. Boom. Yeah, they've got done. it without that guy on, the, you know, so it makes it super easy. But this is what we caught straight out of camera. And you can see all the color cast and stuff yeah. in the ceiling up there. And then the finished image, it's nice and crisp, right? 
So um, let's try to walk through it. Let's see, that second layer is off. So let's try to walk through this. That is brightening up the top. Um, we got some curves going on there for contrast. Uh, we've taken out some of the color there. What is this doing? Oh, we got people. Oh, people we took yeah. some people out and added some people. Yep. Um, some more curves to brighten up that guy on the catwalk. We added another guy, a couple more guys. <laughs> we did some cleanup. And this is, you know, all the distracting shit, yeah. all the exit signs and that kind of stuff. Um, there's another dude uh, that's brightening that office in the yeah. middle. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We cleaned up the whites a little bit more here. White shit. That's what he called it. <laughs> I, when I first saw that, I, 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 I just assumed white shift, but I, I see it's, nope. <laughs> it's missing a letter. No, he's, <laughs> yep, he's cleaning up white shit. So, yeah. um, and that's that'll happen. Um, you know, I'll get stuff back from the editors like that, little jokes and stuff. It'll be like <laughs> distracting AF, you know, and there'll yeah, be all the yeah. like alarms and smoke detectors and stuff, you know. Oh, that that's stuff cool. In there. And, uh, um, obviously, this isn't going to the client, so, you know. Yeah. Uh, let's see. This curves layer is just an overall brightness of the image. We did some hue satch adjustment on uh, the blues on the steel and the mm -hmm. couch and things there. Uh, let's yeah, see. I find we that got... uh, that blue on, um, uh, you know, the, in fact, all the grays uh, tend to to want to tend towards that uh, that blue, um, and you need to you yeah. need to work on that um, every time. I, in my experience. Yeah, and a lot of it is the camera too. I mean, mm. depending on what camera you're shooting with, it's going to be it's going to lean towards different colors. Uh, some will be warm, some will be blue, some will be, you know, some do a horrible job uh, capturing. Orange is usually a tough one, so mm. wood tones. Yeah, um, I find like the Canons uh, struggle to get accurate wood tones, um, yeah. and you usually have to do some color correction on post on wood tones to make them not oversaturated. The yeah. Canons tend to oversaturate wood tones. So, um, what the hell is this layer? Who knows? Um, Hugh Satch, again, I'm not sure where it's. It looks like on the right-hand side, maybe this guy a little bit. Um, sometimes like they're so subtle, I can't tell. Oh, this is the chairs on the left-hand side, those green chairs. You can see they kind of okay. pop. And all of the wood gets a little bit mm. more saturated. So, Or less saturated, I should say. Um, what's this one? I don't know. I got a lot of layers I can't tell. <laughs> LC is lens correction, so that's straightening yeah. up uh, the image. It was off a little bit. And then there's those two sharpening actions, unsharp mask 100 over 1, unsharp mask 15 over 45, and there's our finished image, I think. Oh, no, I did more. More hue satch on the ceiling. Okay, so I'm guessing where this sharpening is from lens correction is probably where I got it back from the editor. Right. Then I do my sharpening on it. And then I went, you know what? I want my whites a little snappier. So mm -hmm. I desaturated them even more. And then this is probably a burn dodge. Bit of a yeah, just a little vignette, vignette to kind yeah. of draw the eye in the middle. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Just to keep the eye in the center of the frame. So that's the stacked image. Uh, so really compositing wise, it's a single image mm. with a whole bunch of people added in as a composite. Yeah. So yeah. that's really the only thing we composited into it was the people. Um, and again, they're all on their own layers so that we can take them on and off. Absolutely. Too, so. so just on the, 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 the Unshop mask, um, now do you, you, they're obviously both on. Um, what is the, um, mm. how do you, how do you, uh, uh, what is the setting that you've used to, to blend those layers? Um, I see at the moment it's, it's highlighted as soft light, but that's for the vignette, I, I'm assuming. Yeah, no, this is just normal. So okay. you have to come up, before you can do it, you have to merge all layers first. Yeah, so I yeah. merge visible into its own layer, stamp visible, whatever you want to call it. It's that one you have to hit every key on the keyboard and E, and it flattens yeah. everything. Into yeah. um, so uh, that creates my flat layer, and then I do the sharpening on the first one. And that's the 100 over one. I always yes, start yeah. with that one because most images do need a little bit of pop. And then I duplicate that layer. Ah, okay, all and right, I, yeah. I add the 15 to 45 on the next layer because that one, you don't always use that second one. If it's already got a lot of contrast in the scene, mm -hmm. I won't use that second layer. Um, so I can toggle it on and off. Um, and, and that lets me see uh, okay. if it's, if I need that extra contrast or not. Okay. Got you. So, but anyway, there's the finished image. They were stoked with it. Um, I shot a whole bunch of them through this space uh, and battled with that stupid wood color. Cast the whole time. <laughs> yeah. That's a problem. Um, you know, but let me take you back again real quick to see the original where we started. Boom. So that's where we started. Um, 
We've even got some flare I'm noticing down here in this yeah. area. Uh, if you look with it's the finished image and, and that, there's some flare in here, some lens flare or something. So Is it uh, uh, coming from the windows on the, the left-hand side um, with that uh, extractor? Yeah, be, over here. Yeah. Probably coming from yeah. the left and hitting that, and it's causing some some flare. So, uh, yeah, it's it's gone here. So, you know, magic. Yeah. It's, it's magic. File save as magic. <laughs> That's right. Yep. I got the magic filter installed, so we just, we just do that. One, I, so. I, I need to get the, you know, version two of that. Mine mine is an early version. Yeah, it's it's really good. In fact, I don't even have to open the computer to use it. I just tell it what to do. So. Wow. Anyway, um, let's see what else we got. If I got something else. Do we got time for more? Or what? Yeah, what yeah, we can do another one. Okay, let's see what else I got here. Um, oh, this is a cool one. Yeah, that's a cool one. I don't know if I have this layered TIFF. I have the raw file. Oh, there's the raw file. I'm just going to open it's it It's going to be interesting to see you. that, yeah. So there's the raw file. Um, again, it's balancing that light, the interior, and it's sitting mm -hmm. there until that happens. Um, good Lord, look at this big, ugly thing up here. Very so, sexy. Um, <clears throat> this is downtown Spokane. Um and this was a real estate office down there. I've shot their new office actually since then. You can see in my portfolio, it's four degrees real estate. And uh, this yeah. was also for HDG architecture. Um, this was a real small one. They had like 10 agents or something like that at the time. Now they have close to 100 agents. Uh, so they've grown in the past five years tenfold, literally. So, um, but there's where we started. And then uh, let's see if I can find the one where we finished here. So this is where we finished. So I almost made it look like daytime. We brightened it up a yeah, lot. Yeah. Um, and then there's a lot of selections going on here. Let me bring up the, the this one again so we can kind of see before and after. So that's where we started. Close this guy. Oh, I lost him. I'm, I'm doing too many things at once <laughs> here. Oh, talk. Okay. Let's see if I can bring this up. Um. You know what I'm going to do is this. I think I'm going to put this on its own little thing, and then we can slide back and forth. So let me open this. Boom. All right. So there's where we started, mm -hmm. and then that's where we are now. So we brighten the whole scene up. I cropped out that ugly light up there, yeah. um, and I got away with it because we brightened up the scene so much that it, it feels almost like a dusk shot, yeah, more so yeah. than a nighttime shot. Um, I remember selecting around the building and bringing up the exposure on the building as a whole. Um, we took out a lot of distracting elements mm. in the scene and then uh, obviously fixed the color cast that was inside on this thing. Yeah, you know it's all yellow. It looks like there's a meth lab inside or something. You know, it's it's horrible. So, um, we kept kind of this old building next to it with that sign. It's it's a historic landmark in Spokane. Yeah. So we didn't want to like lose that stuff on it. It's coming off the screen here. So we kept that there. Um, let's see what else I might have taken out on this. Uh, yeah, there's some cones and some crap down here. This. This thing here, is that in the final image? Yeah, we left it. Um, yeah, look how much brighter it is, though. We got rid of the blue color cast in the sky because it wouldn't have that blue color cast at this time of day. Right. Um, but <laughs> I'll do that. You know, I go out and I'll shoot because I want that interior balanced with the exterior, mm -hmm. but I don't necessarily want it to look like a nighttime shot. So I'll brighten up the whole thing so that it feels like it was a just before dusk kind of thing sometimes. Right. But if I actually went out and shot it at this time of day, you wouldn't see inside. There's no way it would just be dark. Well, that's it. Then, so, you, then you're sitting with multiple exposures trying to, uh, you know, blend them all uh, together, et cetera. Yeah. And, you know, this it's not a perfect image. There's a dude walking here, which is cool. But, you know, there's some blown highlight here mm -hmm. and stuff. But does it matter? You know, I don't. I don't think so. It, the client didn't mind. And there's nothing of importance over there. It's not like I'm blowing out a mural or their logo or something yeah. like that. So it didn't it didn't really matter. Uh, and so I'm looking at that going, do I need to capture another frame where that's not blown and this kind of stuff? And in the end, it's already a white wall. It's not really exactly hurting anything. So um, I thought it just felt kind of organic just to leave some of that stuff. And, and I do that. Blown windows, stuff like that. Yeah. 
I'll, I'll leave it. If, if there's nothing out there to see, uh, people get caught up. I see it, you know, in forums and online and stuff. A lot of people get caught up, you know, uh, Sked doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't even know how to pull views, you know, things yeah. like that. But why do we want to view the parking lot? You know what I mean? It's, a, it's there's nothing to see. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. So it's not important. You know, um, I worry about what's important in the photograph. Uh, and I try to concentrate on those areas. So in this case, it was this whole gray corner of four degrees, the entry wrapping around to the side with their logo. That was what was important yeah. as well as showing, um, how it's situated next to, another building downtown and kind of a historic area. Um, and it just feels like this quaint little real estate shop tucked in next to these big buildings mm. surrounding it. And that's kind of the vibe that they went for when they built the thing, you know? Um, and, uh, and so that's how we try to capture it. So, so when it comes to shooting things like this, um, uh, what is, uh, cause I'm just looking at, um, you know, the, the, that little star bursts on, on the lights on the, the left hand side. What, what aperture mm -hmm. are you using there? Because obviously you don't want to go, uh, you know, with a, 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 a minute aperture that, that um, you know, gives you those very, very pointed star bursts. Um, but at the same time, you want to have enough uh, detail front to back. Right. Um, well, you know, the wider the lens, you're going to get that front to back anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, when you're shooting with a 24 millimeter or something, you're going to be, even at five, six, you're going to be sharp to infinity. Yeah. Um, as long as there's nothing in the foreground. Um, you know, you, you just focus on that building and it'll be everything after that. So, but to get those starbursts, um, uh, probably F10, F11 yeah. is where it starts on that 24 TS. Um, and so if you get to like 16, then they get really pinpointy sharp, yeah. like you say. Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't stop down that much, but I find right around F10, F11, I'd have to pull this up in Photoshop and see where I actually shot it. But, um, that'll give you just a little bit of that starburst where it's still a little hazy, you know? Right. Um, so. So one of the things that I found with um, with the R5 and the the TS lenses um, and the the focus assist is that it, it it actually has become so much easier to to focus using them. Um, you know, whereas before you you need to focus at a certain point and then you know uh, tilt the lens, tilt it, tilt it, yeah, and then take a shot, look front to back, and try and you know get the the you know so that everything's um, you know properly in focus. What uh, what is your experience been with um, with the you know the the, the mirrorless cameras and um, and that uh, type of thing? Um, I'm blind these days, man. I'm, I'm 47 this year, and I, my <laughs> eyes are for shit. So um, focus peaking saves my life, man. Yeah. You know, um, and shooting tethered. So I focus peak everything, um, and when I, when everything that I think should be in focus is red, you know, that's how yeah, I have mine yeah. set up. Um, then then I shoot. And then I look at it in the computer and I can zoom in, you know, and capture one and check for sharpness and stuff. Yeah. And then I can make adjustments if necessary. But, um, you know, that when that came out, when that focus peaking came out on SLRs, I was like, oh, thank God, this is amazing. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, the Sony was one of the first ones to do it. Uh, I had an A7R and that was one of the first ones that had that focus peaking feature. And I was like, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread Absolutely. for a dude with aging eyes, you know. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, so this is um, the Century 21. Um, and this sky is crazy. Uh, let's see, I'm pretty sure I captured it that way. Um, here's the raw file. Yeah, that's mm. the actual sky. It was just a matter of setting white balance to get that really blue saturated sky. Um, you can see the side of the building is dark. And yeah. so I have a bracket um, that, that got us to where we wanted to be, which is there. Um, and we got the inside lit up nicely. Yeah. Um, and this is just bracketing, really. Um, I think we probably added some light around. Let me see if I have flash shots here. Um, oops. Is, so, is, uh, yep. is Tim so your voice activated shots. light stand? That's... Say again? Is, uh, is Tim your voice activated light stand? To go yeah, <laughs> uh, Tim wasn't with me on this one. This okay. is pre-Tim, but yes. Uh, I had a guy with me, uh, Chase Warnick, and Chase was with me for, I don't know, like three, four years or more, something like that. Uh, so Chase, uh, <clears throat> we, I picked him up as an intern mm -hmm. at the local community college photography program, and he was like a rock star working with us as an intern, and so I hired him as an assistant um, after that, and he was with me for several years. Um, 
And uh, then he went on to do his own thing after that. And yeah. I've gone through a few since. Tim's now been with me for what, a little over a year, year and a half? year and a half. Tim's been with me for a year and a half. And uh, unfortunately, the majority of that was uh, through COVID. So poor guy hasn't been to on a whole lot of shoots with yeah. me because COVID was really slow for us. Um, but this year, as you say, with this morning, you know, trying to race here for this conversation with you, I had a client meeting uh, and he's dropping another dozen projects on us. That's just the one client. So I think this year is going to be outrageous i mean we're just going to be running ragged uh this year so <clears throat> i actually had a conversation with another shooter yesterday about bringing him on just to help us uh when we get out on shoots uh to have somebody capture um some of the detail shots and things like that, right. that we need to get for the client um just because there's only so much time in a day you know exactly um, so uh, let's see. But you can see here the light. Uh, that's mm -hmm. flash. Uh, so I walk around with a flash and just pop it off in different areas. Uh, this is the – let me see if I'm showing up in here. Let me turn off the mask if it will let me. Oh, that's the wrong one. There. Oh, that's our selection. So, yeah, I'm just selecting certain areas of this brighter frame. Um, there's more light. Yeah. More flash. Um, color. Contrast. Brightening up the parking lot, adding more contrast, merging it, more curves, bringing up some saturation, taking out some saturation in the parking lot, straightening shit up, uh, brightening the scene overall. What am I doing? Oh, get rid of the color cast on the uh, brick wall in the background. Get rid of some signage. Yeah. I hope I put it back. <laughs> oh, there yeah, it there goes. we go. There it goes. There it goes. Okay. Uh, taking out the saturation inside of that ugly green and, and yellow color cast inside. Doing some general retouch cleanup. Um, overall darkening, evidently. What's this? Looks like some saturation in the middle, maybe. Um, and that's it. So... Yeah. Uh, so that's, again, it's a really, um, you know, we get an overall photo and then it's just this one. We had to flash some areas cause it was so dark. So we bring in those, those brighter areas, uh, just kind of paint them in and then there's your finished image. So, um, I don't love this image. Uh, it's really not one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. Other people like it, I guess, cause of the sky, but, um, uh, you know, I'm not married to all the images, but I have these little points on here and these are little points you can drop in Photoshop um, and it will give you an info, a readout in your info right. panel for each of those points. And you can see what your RGB values are. So if you're trying to get a neutral tone somewhere, you can keep adjusting your color until you see the info panel read out what you want it to. Uh, and then, you know, you've got that neutral area there. So. Well, I, I'm, I, I mean, I quite like the, the the image, but I suppose it's um, you know it's because it's just got that that really nice, clean, crisp feel to it, um, you know. That, and it's as I said yeah. earlier, it's it's one of the things that <clears throat> um, that I really like about your work is that it just it just uh, it, it looks like a rendering, um, you know, the the way that um, that it's gone from uh, the original to to the completed uh, retouched image. Uh, it's just uh, really clean and um, yeah, I mean, really, <laughs> I I love it. Yeah, it's I get that a lot, the rendering thing and clients they give me that uh, often, too. And I think it's because um, because the colors are so um, decontaminated, mm -hmm. I guess is a good word. Yeah, um, it's what their eye sees when you walk into a room that has warm yellow light. You don't see everything as warm yellow. That's you right. see white walls as white. You know, you're, that's what your brain does yeah. to correct it. And so what we do in the image is correct the image so that it matches what your brain saw when you walked in or looked at a, at a building, you know. Um, and because people aren't used to seeing color correction done to that extent, uh, it feels like a rendering to them because that's the only other time you really see colors that are white, white, you know, or, yeah. or whatever, whatever color it is, you know, so um, it, good or bad. I, that's my style. Some people don't like it. That's fine. I, I have no argument for you know, it being better or worse than, than another method or a different look. It's just what I do. It's what what I like. And fortunately I have clients that like it too. So I've been able to stay in business. Exactly. I mean, it, that's at the yeah. end of the day, you know, you, you've got to be the one that, um, that enjoys the, the, what you're putting out because, 
uh, that's what you're doing day in and day out. And 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 thank goodness uh, we have clients that enjoy what uh, what we put out because uh, <laughs> that's how we it's how we make a living. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, and to elaborate on why I don't like this, uh, there's a lot of weird stuff in the background here that's kind of bunching up. Um, mm-hmm. You know, all of these different layers back here of roofs and things. I don't like when when things get that tight. I would have rather been higher to separate some of that stuff a little bit. Right. Um, and then I don't love this angle. And I think the reason I shot this was because if I moved any more to the left, uh, the the far side of this building was a mess for um, – um, landscape and stuff was mm. still there was probably a tractor over there or something that I wanted to keep out of the thing you right. know so I was limited on my angles and I hate being limited on stuff like that when I can't necessarily shoot it the way that I want to do it and so while it may be a fine image to people looking at it in my brain I'm like this isn't what yeah. I want you know and so yeah. um, you know but anyway hopefully uh Hopefully that helps going through some of the images. Hopefully uh, I made sense to you guys. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, thanks for letting me walk through some of that stuff. No, absolutely. That's absolutely cool. Let me just uh, put us back together there. All right, there we go. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, as I said um, uh, in my intro, uh, I'm uh, a bit of a uh, starstruck here today. Um, I certainly uh, am grateful that you've taken the time to uh, to chat with me and, and take you take me through your images. Uh, it's uh, it's it's just it's amazing that um, that we have this the, the technology to be able to reach out across the ocean and say well listen do you want to have a bit of a chat show me your man. images it's uh, it's it's crazy um, but yeah really the, the and also the, the 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 fact that you you know willing to come on um, give me your your time uh, I really really appreciate it it, uh, it makes a, a huge uh, a huge impression and um, you know I think. Uh, the work is great. Love your images, and um, I'm, I'm glad that I can have you on the channel and, and inspire, motivate some of the guys um, in in the group. Well, I'm honored to be asked, man. I mean, it, it really is. Um, I'm just a guy in Spokane making photos, yeah. and anytime somebody asks me to share what I do, I'm like, really? You know me? <laughs> you know so. Uh, I'm always surprised uh, when when I get reactions from people that are. Um, you know, interested to hear what it is that, like, how I capture the images mm-hmm. and, and, the, and the process that I have, because to me, it's just, you know, I, I don't know, it just seems kind of mundane. Yeah, but, uh, that's what you do. I, I get it, you know. Right, it's just what I do. So, and, and I don't, um, um, there's so many people out there these days that are so good. I yeah. mean, you get on social media and you look at some of these things and, and people, what they're doing, and you just... I want to sell my camera some days <laughs> and then go find a, get, get a job at Costco, you know, um, yeah. stocking shelves or something. Cause I'm like, I'm not worthy, you know? Um, and, and it's just, just keep pushing through and keep making images as long as people keep hiring me yeah. and, and somebody better and, and doesn't come along and steal all my clients uh, until then I'll, I'll keep doing keep what going. I do. So for sure. Yeah. No, but that's good. Thank you so much for inviting me out here. And it was, uh, it's, it's really cool to, to share images with people around the world. Um, and as you say, uh, being able to share my screen, I got a computer in my pocket, yeah. you know, I mean, it's how crazy is technology, right? You know? Absolutely. So, um, it's, it's just cool to be able to share work and talk about projects this way. So absolutely. Thanks. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it and enjoy the, enjoy the weekend. It's a, the, I suppose you, you, what are you now about uh, 11 AM? Your time? Uh, yeah, right on. Yeah, yeah, okay. eleven o'clock a.m. So I've got a shoot this afternoon, and then uh, I want to cut loose. We're going to go down to Brick West this afternoon and drink yeah. beers, and then uh, call it a weekend, spend some family time. So. Fantastic! Thanks, Tony. I appreciate it, man. Have a great weekend. Thank you. You do the same. All right. Cheers.